What should you eat? There are so many options. Fast food, frozen dinners, ethnic takeout, home cooking. Are you on a diet? Do you eat low fat, low carbs, good carbs? Paleo, raw, Mediterranean? But is it healthy? Do you eat uh, buy organic, um, avoid trans fats, go gluten free? Get your omega-3s. Watch out for E. coli and mad cows. Do you eat ethically? Are you vegetarian, vegan, fair trade, consumer sustainable? It's no wonder we're anxious. There are so many options out there. And we just, it's enough to drive you crazy. But we're not the first generation to worry about our food. Peasant farmers of the past never knew if bad weather would ruin their crops. Today's industrial agriculture fills our supermarkets, but with newfangled products that may not be healthy. Dietary advice is confusing and contradictory. Many people have lost faith in the technologies of the modern industrial food system. They look for advice to people like Michael Pollan, who declared, don't eat anything your great-grandmother wouldn't recognize as food. Home cooking has declined, they say, because shoppers have been seduced by convenience. This do-it-yourself, good food movement seeks to escape from industrial fast food and reclaim locally grown, home-cooked foods. They advocate a politics of the shopping cart, building a better world with every consumer purchase. But can we feed the world that way? From a historical perspective, these people ask the right questions, but they too easily romanticize peasant farmers and home cooks of the past. To build a truly just and sustainable food system, we need to think in new ways about the labor of farming and cooking. The industrial food system that the new agrarians oppose is based on intensive commodity agriculture. It seeks to maximize yields through monoculture, standardized seeds, and chemical inputs. In doing so, it reduces biodiversity to a farmyard equivalent of the Industrial Revolution's interchangeable parts. Critics say the system is unhealthy, unsustainable, and unjust. It's unhealthy not only because we eat too much, leading to diabetes and heart disease, but also because of contamination from E. coli bacteria, pesticides, and antibiotics. It's also unsustainable. Pesticide residues, fertilizer runoff, soil salinification, and water shortages are strip mining the soil. Finally, it's unjust. Corporate control is undermining democratic governance of the food system from the seed to the marketplace. Giant seed companies use new intellectual property laws to claim ownership of plants that farmers have been breeding successfully for thousands of years. Meanwhile, supermarket chains are privatizing the infrastructure of distribution. As the rich come to depend on private labels to guarantee quality, the poor lose the benefit of government food inspection. We can quibble about the details. We can fight over the answers. But we cannot escape the scope of these problems, especially with global climate change. But that doesn't mean we can go back to an idyllic past. The good food narrative of Michael Pollan, Wendell Berry, and Barbara Kingsolver evokes an agrarian pastoral society rooted in Anglo-American traditions. Their hero is the yeoman farmer, a self-sufficient man of the soil, a man like Thomas Jefferson. 
third president of the United States, cosmopolitan thinker, and home gardener. But Jefferson was already part of an industrial food system more than 200 years ago. He owned hundreds of African slaves who worked thousands of acres of land. In this empire of liberty for white men, Jefferson raised commercial crops like tobacco, wheat, and livestock for export to Europe. Already in the 18th century, Virginia hams were prized by the gentry of England, where local hogs were being raised in early industrial feedlots. Their meat was fed to the growing urban markets of London, and they were fattened on the city's chamber pots. Long distance trade is not inherently bad. We need it to cope with the vagaries of weather. Even before modern transportation, markets helped balance the fluctuations of farm production. Organics were once seen as being an alternative to industrial food. They were supposed to be the healthy peasant food that grandma cooked. Now, they are industrial. Although many people can't afford them, even at Walmarts. Nor are organics any less labor intensive. Modern farms, large or small, conventional or organic, rely on undocumented migrant workers. It's a modern version of the old plantation. Finally, the good food movement calls out for home cooking. And that's not surprising. At times of social crisis, we often look inward to the hearth. During the market revolution of the 1820s, Sylvester Graham told women to bake whole grain graham crackers. The back to the land hippies of the 1960s idealized earth mother baked cooks with long hair and peasant skirts. All of these movements relied on the unpaid labor of women in the kitchen. My own great-grandmother was a Kansas farm wife, but she didn't really like cooking. She grew wonderful tomatoes. She just didn't want to spend weeks every summer canning them to make it through the winter. The good food movement is absolutely right to seek to reclaim home-cooked meals. But that doesn't mean that women should be working alone and without pay in the kitchen. Feeding children should not mean interrupted careers, low pay, guilt, and anxiety for women. Sharing domestic labor is not a feminist issue. It's an economic issue for families that can only survive with dual incomes. The desire for a do-it-yourself politics of healthy and ethical consumption is understandable at a time when big money dominates national politics. But do-it-yourself shifts the burden of labor without addressing the inequalities. Those who actually try it are often surprised at how hard the work is and how meager the rewards. And even if we, as individuals, can manage to feed ourselves off the land, it's because of the historic dispossession of others. Gardens simply cannot feed the world. We need an intensive food system, just not the one we currently have. We need a food system that takes labor seriously, one that recognizes not only celebrity chefs, but also feeding children and washing dishes, not to mention migrant workers in the fields and slaughterhouses. Today's unregulated markets supply not what we want, but what is convenient for big business. Under these circumstances, consumer politics can only bring us anxiety. We need a politics not of the shopping cart, but of the ballot box and the union hall. We need to elect representatives who will legislate and regulate to ensure living wages, safe workplaces, 
and careful food inspection. What would such a food system look like? There are many technologies for intensive agriculture. The ones that come to market, whether double cross hybrid seeds in the 1930s or GMOs today, are not always the most useful or productive. Instead, they are the ones that generate the biggest profits for seed companies. Supermarkets claim that only they have the knowledge and reach to oversee quality and distribute food efficiently in a global food system. But during the world wars, Allied ration boards did exactly that, as did the interwar British Empire Marketing Board. The best alternative to a women's labor in the kitchen is not McDonald's, it's immigrant restaurants and street vendors. Admittedly, they often exploit labor too, but at least they show there are tasty, affordable, made from scratch options between do-it-yourself and the Big Mac. Will it all add up? Is this a utopian dream? No. It's the cooperative farm, labor, and consumer movements that thrived in North America in the mid 20th century. We turned away from these collective movements in the 1980s, and radical individualism has given us only anxiety and inequality, which leads so many to try to do it yourself. In these circumstances, we need to um, search out what the answers are and, and do it in a way that will um, achieve just food for all. So, what is um, the answer? Should we eat locally grown, home cooked food? Absolutely, whenever we can. At the University of Toronto Scarborough's Culinary Research Center, we have a kitchen laboratory where students cook in class. They do it not to become chefs, but to learn the importance of culinary labor in human society. With historical perspective, they learn not to romanticize peasant farmers or grandma's cooking. They also learn to question claims that billions will starve without GMOs or standardized monoculture. Finally, they learn about historical transformations achieved through collective action and government regulation. In today's industrial food system, only the rich can afford to eat like peasants. With political will, we can create an alternative but still intensive agricultural system that provides healthy and sustainable food for all.